here, please stand in your able and uh, let's worship.
good morning, Westmont. I'm Emma Leathers, and I'm the SFC for VK. Good morning, I'm Claire Bassett. I'm the SFC for Emerson. First Thessalonians 5.18 reminds us, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Even in encouraging us to be grateful, God is doing something really good for us. Retired Westmont professor of education, Dr. Jane Wilson says, a growing body of social science research reveals that gratitude has the power to heal, energize, and transform lives. This time of year helps us to remember to be specific in our thanksgiving toward, to God and to the people who walk with us and support us through tough times. In addition to the gratitude leads in the library, the SFCs met together and came up with the idea to foster gratitude at Westmont. We made thankfulness cards that will be available after chapel as well as in your rest halls and in the DC. So the way that it works, and you may have picked this up already, is that each card has five lines on it, and you can write the name of someone that you're grateful for, maybe on the first line, and you can either tell them to their face or write a note about why you're thankful for them and hand it to them. And the way that it will continue is then that person will receive that card, write down another person's name until all five lines are filled out, so we can continue recognizing and reflecting um, on how appreciative we are for those in our community. Um, another just reminder is after um, the message today, four SFCs will be available um, if you need prayer in all four corners. So if you need prayer, don't hesitate to come up and we'll be waiting for you. Thank you. Good morning, Westmont. My name is Brooke Murphy and today, thank you. And today, I have the pleasure of introducing my professor, friend, and pastor, Dr. Helen Ree. Dr. Ree graduated from UC Berkeley with a degree in history and earned a Master of Divinity and a Doctor of Philosophy at Fuller Theological Seminary. Before coming to Westmont in 2004, she served as pastor of Hana Church in Buena Park, California. She is an ordained minister at Free Methodist Church Santa Barbara and serves as the department chair of the Religious Studies Department here at Westmont. She specializes in early Christian literature, theology, wealth and poverty, and Greco-Roman medicine. And her latest book is titled Illness, Pain, and Healthcare in Early Christianity. Not only is Dr. Ree an accomplished scholar, but is one of the kindest people I have had the privilege of knowing. She is patient, earnest, and brave enough to live out her faith in the midst of hardships. If you have taken one of her classes, you are already familiar with the devotion, wit, and excitement she brings to her students and subject matter. Before we hear from her, I invite you to uncross your legs, ground your feet, sit up nice and tall, and take a deep breath in and out. And please um, open your hearts and minds to receive what Dr. Ree has for us today. Thank you. Hello, Westmont. Okay, you can do it better, right? Yeah. You know that, right? Hello, Westmont. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I am so honored and grateful to be here to be able to share God's word with you. And let's go straight to scripture. The t today's text comes from Romans 8, 31 through 39, one of the most comforting and famous texts in the New Testament. So as I read, please, slide. you see the slides up here, please follow along. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies who is to condemn, it is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? 
Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. What then are we to say about these things? Apostle Paul asks in verse 31. What are these things to which we need to respond? These things refer to what Paul has been talking about in Romans 8, 18 and on. He's been talking about our present sufferings, but also our future glory as the children of God that far outweighs what we are going through right now. What are we, all, what are we to make of all these things? How should we respond to all these promises and the truth of God? Now, how many professors do you know who answer their own questions in class? (laughs) I'm one of them. (laughs) Now, here, Paul answers his own question. And his answer is to ask five more questions. And the answers to those questions are contained in the questions themselves. The key to understand this, the key to understanding this passage is the word, I am convinced, in verse 38. In Greek, it's one word. This Greek word has a basic meaning of to weigh. Paul is saying, look, I've 30 through, I've weighed it all on the scale, I balanced it all, and it all tips in this direction. He then calls us to go through the same process. Paul is lifting up before us in this text the real troubles, real pressures, real disappointments, real demands, and real dangers we face in this fragile world. And then he lifts up right alongside all of those, the real events that happened in the late 20s of the first century Palestine, when Jesus of Nazareth ministered, suffered, was crucified, buried, and raised from the dead. Take all those equally real facts, stand them up against one another, and ask, what shall we say to these things? In this text, Apostle Paul is calling us to build up our belief system so that we can respond to the events of life with constructive emotions from the perspective of God's truth. That's what faith is about. Paul is practicing what he is exhorting us to do in Romans 12, 2, which says, Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He is exhorting us to do this because our emotional response to these things is not due to these things, but due to what we believe about these things, particularly due to what we believe about where the living God is in these things. Paul is calling us to let the events of the gospel determine how we respond to the events of life. So Paul does this by uh, posing five rhetorical questions. And I believe these questions are the very questions that Paul himself probably asked again and again and tried to evaluate his life and responses to life in light of what he knew and believed about the gospel events. So what I want to do is briefly take up these five questions one at a time, briefly, And I want to invite you to think and reason along with me about these questions and to allow the truth of God to guide your responses to the events of your life. So Paul's answer, five questions. First question, question uh, number one, verse 31. 
If God is for us, who is against us? In the face of very real opposition, the opposition that might make us angry, hurt, or afraid, Paul challenges us to this question. If God is for us, who can be against us? The essence of his question is contained in the if clause. If God is for us. God is for us. This is a dangerous statement at one level because it's often abused. However, we should not discard this statement because it is true in Christ. This statement, God is for us, is a concise summary of the message of the book of Romans. And it is a concise summary of the message of the gospel itself. The gospel events, the incarnation, the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ loudly declare forever that God is for us. A Swiss theologian and pastor, Karl Barth, often encouraged his congregation to say this phrase out loud, four times emphasizing different word each time. God is for us. God is for us. God is for us. God is for us. If the living God, who is the creator and redeemer of all creation, is for us, who is against us? If Paul had simply asked, who is against us, we would immediately have been bombarded by so many answers. We have formidable foes assailing against us. Just look at the list of, of afflictions in verse 35. Troubles and hardships of life, natural disasters, our own sinful nature, people, and the devil itself. Indeed, all of them are together marshaled against us. Paul here is not suggesting that since God is for us, no one is trying to be against us. He's asking us to think, who can finally stand against us if God is for us? Who can finally prevail against us, prevail over us, since God is on our side? Think to yourself. Stand, take yourself in hand. Argue against your fears. That's what Paul is getting at. The cross and empty tomb declare that God has met all those foes and decisively won. Our fear of opposition is not due to the opposition, but due to what we believe about the opposition. If God is for us, who can be against us? Question number two, verse 32. He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Here, Paul is helping us with FOMO, fear of missing out. It turns out FOMO is not just a 21st, North century, 21st century North American emotion. The Roman Christians in the first century struggled with this fear. Fear of missing out the goodness of life. Fear of losing out God's very best for us. When things are not coming together, when things seem falling apart, Paul is saying, what do the gospel events say? At the cross, the living God has given us God's most precious possession. God's one and only son. God did not withhold him back, but delivered him up for us. In giving God's son, God gave us the best of all possible gifts. Since God has done the unspeakably great and costly thing, shall we not be confident that God will do and give what is by comparison far less? Paul is arguing that if God has given us the greatest gift to meet our greatest needs, would God not give us the lesser gifts to meet our lesser needs? 
If this is the extent of God's commitment to us, who are often unfaithful, ungrateful, and thoroughly selfish, can we not trust God to freely hand over to us everything else we need with God's Son? Well, what do you think? The answer to this question determines a lot about the quality of our lives. This question gets at the bottom line issue that we face again and again in our discipleship. Can we trust God to take care of us if we go all out for Jesus Christ? If I, get just, if I just cut loose, and if I'm really serious about my faith and go for it, can God really take care of me? If I really obey God and obey God's call upon my life, will I still be able to take care of my loved ones? Think, says Paul. Reason it out. Argue against your fears. What are the events of the gospel saying? At the cross, God says, I am the one who gives you my very best and my all. If I hand it over my son to you, don't you think with him I will give you my peace, my strength, my wisdom, my love, my joy, and my riches? When we doubt the faithfulness and goodness of God, I don't know about you, but I do sometimes doubt the faithfulness and goodness of God. We need to go back to the cross and ask, God, who didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will God not freely, generously give us all things? Well, that's right, that's right, you say. But there is something, there is a sense that something is still holding you back. You're asking, doesn't God freely give all things to only those who are always good? Question number three, verse 33. Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Do you ever do something about which you feel so awful and terrible that you begin to wonder if you were ever saved? Your pride is so great, your anger is so strong, your jealousy is so intense, your lust so uncontrollable, your hypocrisy so deceptive, your bitterness so paralyzing, or your self-centeredness so entrenched that you fear you're losing your place in the family of God. You confess your sin and confess your sin over and over again, and you yet you feel still feel unacceptable to God. There's a sense of guilt and shame just lingering on and on. Ever happened to you? What are we to do at such time? Again, think, think, says Paul. Stand those feelings up against the events of the gospel. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. This question evokes the picture of a courtroom, and it takes us back to the cross. At the cross, the living God freely and willingly acquitted us and justified us. At the cross, the judge of the universe who could actually accuse us has instead handed down the verdict, fully pardoned. Now listen to this. This verdict is not based on what I did or did not do with my life but entirely based on what Jesus Christ has done with his own life. Paul says, if this is the case, now think who is in the position of reversing God's verdict on your life. Question number four, who is to condemn? Now, Paul presses the question further. Who is there to condemn us? Well, this time again, there is someone to condemn us, none other than Jesus Christ. Because of his unique status and because of his sinless character, Jesus has the authority to judge and condemn us. But look at the rest of the verse 34. Christ Jesus, 
who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. The only one in the universe who has the right to condemn us, died for us, rose for us, reigns in power over us, and prays for us. In the heavenly courtroom, the only one who has the right to condemn us, pardoned us, and set us free. Yet after repenting of your sins, hearing God's verdict, there are still those times you find yourself wallowing in your guilt and shame. Why do we still do that? It's because we do not forgive ourselves, which is to say at that moment we have usurped the power, the position of Jesus Christ in not forgiving ourselves after Jesus Christ has already forgiven us, we are setting ourselves up as a higher tribunal than Jesus Christ. Do not commit the sin of pride by not forgiving yourself for the things that God and Christ has forgiven you. Just receive it. Receive his forgiveness and get on with it. Finally, we are moving on to the last point. But you still hesitate because you assume that when bad things happen to you, they are the sign or result of God's disfavor upon you. When we encounter bad things in life, have we concluded that they are the evidence of God's rejection of us? Question number five, verse 35 who will separate us from the love of Christ? Here, Paul is getting at the fear that something is going to happen in our lives that will put us outside the range of the love of God. I call that fear phoba, fear of being abandoned. The question touches the fear of being abandoned. Fear of being left out. So Paul asks, who or what can possibly separate us from the loving companionship of Jesus Christ? Think. Paul certainly recognizes that there's a lot of potential threats. He lists seven possibilities in verse 35. Trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword. When we find ourselves up against these things, does it mean that we are cut off and deserted from God's love? Well, it surely feels like that, doesn't it? However, where does your feeling come from? From the event or what we believe or perceive about the event? The fact of the matter is, that the tribulation, hardship, or persecution just may be the result of Christ's companionship. The first word in the list, trouble, in Greek, thalipsis, is a technical vocabulary in the New Testament. Thalipsis, tribulation, tribula refers to the turmoil that starts to be stirred up when the kingdom of God starts to break into the kingdom of our world. It is a crushing pressure that happens when the kingdom of light invades the kingdom of darkness. When our old self encounters the truth of the gospel, when, we get, when uh, you get stirred up and feel the pressure, conflict, crisis to change from our old ways and to follow God's ways, being caught in the midst of that make you, may make you feel like that you are deserted by Christ. But in fact, it's just the opposite. It's because you're loyal to Christ that you are caught in the middle of that. Apostle Paul experienced all of these firsthand, and we find out in his letters that all these things were not due to the fact that he was separated from Christ, but they were due to the fact that he belonged to Christ. That's why Paul is quoting Psalm 44 in verse 36. For your sake we face death all day long. 
we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. What Paul is saying is, these things happen to us precisely because we are the people belong to Christ. What Paul is saying is then think, can these things separate us from the love of Christ? Of course not. They are the very things that Christ himself suffered, and they didn't separate Christ the Son from the Father's love. Paul says in verse 37, no, in these things, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. In all these things, not apart from all these things, not out of all these things, not beyond all these things, but we are more than conquerors in all these things through him who is with us in all these things. Take all you know about the present circumstances. Take all you know about the God who is revealed to us in Jesus Christ and stand them up together and see what happens. So what is Paul's conclusion? Verse 38, I am convinced, he says, nothing can separate us from Christ's love. I have weighed it out. I have measured it. And it all leans to this direction. The New Living Bible translates verses 38 through 39 like this. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can't, and life can't, the angels can't, the demons can't, our fears for today, our worries for tomorrow, and even the powers of hell cannot keep God's love away. Whether we are high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul's five questions are not arbitrary questions. They are all about the kind of God we believe in and worship. Our confidence is not in our love for God, which is frail, fickle, and faltering, but in God's love for us, which is steadfast, faithful, and ever-enduring. Brothers and sisters, the love of God is the love that will never let us go. I am absolutely convinced that nothing in this world can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. What about you? Well, that is the best news you will ever hear. No joke. Um, just a reminder, the SFCs will be in each of the corners, um, available for prayer. Maybe you want to pray for a deeper kind of knowledge and confidence in this love of God. Invite the worship, the string players up. And um, uh, Dr. Ree suggested we sing this hymn, Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus, which takes themes that were so prominent in that um, scripture verse that we just read. And if you know the story of this hymn and kind of the story that it comes out of, um, the person who wrote this text was really at the end of their rope, um, uh, was in a desperate situation, and was met by the boundless love of God and experienced that in a transformative way. And so I just encourage you, wherever you are, um, may your prayer as you sing this song be that you could encounter the deep, deep love of Jesus that goes deeper than just our feelings or even our own um, ability to love our present circumstances, but it is grounded in the events of the gospel um, because Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. So I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing, Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus.
For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jackie Takarabe, and I have the honor of being this year's Intercultural Programs Business Manager and also your, one of your Global Leadership Center RAs. And I'm here to tell you about an amazing ICP event that, in which we've partnered with both the GLC and WAC to put on our international night market happening this Sunday. Um, students, staff, and faculty members have all made foods from various cultures for us to eat. So y'all better pull up because it's going to be amazing. So join us this Sunday from 7 to 9 p.m. on Magnolia Lawn and the Formal Gardens to have some amazing food and conversations. So I better be seeing you guys there. Thank you, and now take whatever posture you'd like to receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Take care and bless up, Westmont.
Come play with us.